for the Coast Grants webinar. Um, this webinar will be recorded, um, so um, so you can find this um, presentation on our website later for reference. So presenting today um, will be me. Um, my name is Irvin, um, and helping me out is Aaron and Morgan. Um, on Zoom, we have Bryce and Chalney who will help with the chat and question and answers. And Vera is our Zoom facilitator. All right, um, so next slide. Okay, so on today's agenda, um, we will go over the webinars logistics, which is what we're doing right now. Then we will go over the Explore the Coast program, um, our program priorities, um, program funding. Um, then we'll go over the different parts of the applications and scoring, and we will end um, with a question answer section. So throughout the webinar, um, Shalini and Bryce will be the chat monitor to help answer questions as we go along. Uh, feel free to input your questions in the question answer box um, and we will answer the, the questions um, regarding the applications and anything else we discuss in a, in a question answer format. Um, so as I said earlier, this webinar is recorded and will be posted on our webpage afterwards. Um, additionally, Spanish translation is available. So if you go to the um, bottom of your Zoom screen panel, you'll see a globe that says interpretation. Um, if you would like to enable Spanish translation, um, please click um, interpretation and select Spanish. Um, you can choose to mute the original audio if you only want to hear um, the Spanish, um, Spanish audio. That said, we will go ahead and get started to um, part one of the Exported Coast program. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so um, Explore the Coast, um, California's ocean, coast, and beaches are spaces of joy, relaxation, and healing. The ability to experience the coast without fear of financial costs, physical barriers, or feelings of not belonging is crucial to how people cultivate their own lifelong connections uh, with the coast. So our Explore the Coast priorities um, include providing an enjoyable and healing experience at the coast, um, positive lifelong, positive long-term impact, inspire ongoing leadership and coastal stewardship, connect groups that consistently face barriers by providing opportunities for community leadership, serve the diverse population of California and also help reduce economic, physical, operational, or societal barriers. Our, um, the State Coastal Conservancy Explore the Coast program seeks to provide coastal experiences for people and community who face challenges to assessing or enjoying the coast the ETC, um, Explore the Coast, priority communities include, but are not limited to lower income individuals and households, people with disabilities, people of color, immigrant communities, and foster youth, among others. Next slide, please. So in this slide, we'll talk about um, the types of program we fund. Um, so. Programs that we fund include ones that bring people to the coast to play, learn to surf, kayak, sail, and other activities. Programs that are hands-on, highly interactive, immersive, and help build positive connections with the coast. We're also looking um, for programs that not only help participants overcome barriers to the coast, um, but ones that also help reduce uh, barriers in the long run by giving people the skills to feel safe and comfortable near the ocean, letting people see that others from their community or who look like them are at the beach, teaching folks how to get to the beach or many other ways. We also look for programs um, with opportunities to help build leadership or job skills. So some examples that we have highlighted on the slides um, include 
the NOYO Center for Marine Science, uh, which is located in Fort Bragg. So this program uh, provides an outdoor marine science after school program with whale watching, electric boat tours, and fun science activities. Um, in the middle, we have um, me surf and ocean education outdoor exploration camp um, based out of San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and this program provides surf and ocean education camps to over 600 youths from low income and impacted community from um, the city of San Francisco. And lastly, to uh, on the right, we have um, the Watsonville Wetland Watch. Um, and this group helps um, provide kayaking and beach trips for 192 participants um, and, and their families. Next slide. So programs that we do not fund. Um, so pro projects that solely focus on classroom-based programs and or curriculum, um, we don't fund those. Uh, constructions of facilities. So the Conservancy has funded hundreds of other projects that um, include like building new trails, trailheads or other amenities, such as beach stairways, bathrooms and overlooks through um, our other funded program. Um, if your project falls under that category, um, you can feel free to um, contact us directly, but that will not be funded under the, our Explore the Coast grants. And lastly, um, projects that are solely uh, beach cleanup focus, um, we also do not fund, fund those. Okay, um, so more about the Explore the Coast grants for the 2024 year. Um, we expect about 800,000 to be available for the 2024-2025 grants round, but we won't know for sure until the budget is approved in June. Um, of the 800,000, approximately 134,000 um, is available for participants to go to the San Francisco Bay shoreline. The remaining 666,000 must be used um, to bring participants to the outer coast. Maximum award per project is 100,000 and projects can start in late 2024 or early 2025. And all projects must finish by December, um, 2027. So if you're an organization with the current um, Explore the Coast grants, um, you cannot apply for funding that would overlap with your um, with existing grants. Therefore, um, organizations with a current Explore the Coast grant are only eligible to apply if their grants will be completed by March 1st, 2026. So applications for um, this for 2024-2025 Explore the Coast grant round is due on January 31st, um, 2024 by 11.59 p.m. And um, selected projects will be presented to the Conservancy's board for funding approval um, in the following fall of um, 2024. So once the Conservancy has approved the grant at our um, public meeting um, when we present it to the board, our staff will prepare a grant agreement setting forth the terms and conditions of the grant the grantee must sign the grant agreement and comply with all its conditions in order to receive funds. Expenses incurred before the grant agreement with the Conservancy is executed cannot be billed to the grant. And please note, um, the Conservancy reimburses grantees for expenses after they are incurred. This means grantee will have to cover the cost of the projects between the time the expenses are incurred to when they are paid by the Conservancy. In some circumstances, um, the grantee can receive grant funding in advance rather um, than being paid in um, error. Grantees are typically required to maintain general liability, uh, automobile, and other forms of insurance during the terms of the grant agreements. Um, and see, all conservancy grantees should be expected to be audited by the state of California. So it's a grantee's responsibility to be responsible, to maintain all necessary records, to substantiate and document all payments made pursuant to a conservancy grant. If a grantee 
cannot provide adequate records when they are audited, they may be required to repay the grant fund. Okay. And with that, um, I will pass it on to Erin, who will go over the application. Thanks, Urban. So yes, we'll be going through the application now. Our chat monitor, Shalini or Rice, will drop a link in the chat to the application page. Eligible, eligible agencies for Explore the Coast grants are public agencies, federally recognized tribes, and nonprofit organizations with 501c3 status. If you are not one of those groups, you may be able to apply still with a fiscal sponsor who will need to have 501c3 status. Some changes from previous year's applications based on feedback from grantees include um, having the instructions and application be in separate documents, an easier format to follow, questions that are more specific to better understand your projects. And then for the budget section, there is a table that grantees and applicants will need to fill out. We've offered two different options for how to fill that table out and we'll be going over that later in the presentation. And similar to last year, we are offering a Google Docs version of the application, which can be downloaded and filled out on Google Docs um, and then converted to a Word document to submit to us. So here we have pictured the cover page for the application, which I'll briefly go over. First, you're gonna to wanna to list your contact information, such as your organization, a contact person, title and phone number, et cetera. There's a space there for website or if you use social media, um, that's helpful for us to see if you wanna share that. Next, we have the project information. You're gonna list the project name, the amount of funds requested and your uh, estimated start and end dates. We've added a spot to indicate whether your proposed project is a new or existing program for your organizations. Please be sure to let us know about that. And finally, the cover page ends with location information, meaning what facilities or places will be utilized during your project. So where are you going to go on the coast? What places um, are you planning to go to? You'll submit your completed application to grants at scc.ca.gov by 11.59 p.m. on January 31st, 2024. Next slide, please. Okay, so the next section on the application is the project summary and overview. We have two questions that help reviewers to understand your project. The first question is what? We want to know what the project is, what participants will be doing, explain what the activities and trips will look like for the people attending the trip. For example, low-income youth and their families going on trips to the beach for surfing lessons and picnicking. The second question is who, why, and how. Describe the ETC priority community and why the project, the project serves that intended community. Explain any barriers and how the program will address them. For example, providing surfing lessons and lunches for low-income youth reduces an economic barrier because the price of gas, lessons, equipment, and food is a barrier for low-income youth to access the coast. Next slide. Okay, ETC priority communities served. Question three helps us better understand how many participants from a priority community the grant will serve. Prior priority communities are communities who face challenges accessing or enjoying the coast. Keep in mind, 70% of your participants must be from an ETC priority community. This has been raised from last year. The minimum was 60%. This year, it's 70%. Next slide, please. Okay, in the top part of the table, you're gonna estimate the number of participants you expect to serve from those ETC priority communities. Please include the source for your estimates, such as school district free and reduced lunch statistics if you're working with the school district, or if your organization internally surveys to keep track of who your program is serving, you can use those surveys as your source. You can find example, oh, yeah, thanks. You can find examples of completed tables on the RFP site or linked in the application instructions. Shalini will also put the link in the chat for you to access those examples so it can show what a table might look like for your example project. Um, next slide, please. 
In the lower part of the table, please fill in the estimated number of participants from each California region. You can see we have this colored map that shows how we define the different regions for Explore the Coast projects. It's also in the application instructions. And so you're going to estimate the number of percent of participants from each region that you are bringing to the coast. Next slide, please. Next questions are gonna be on recruitment and cultural inclusivity. So questions four and five help us understand how inclusive your program is. Question four is participant outreach. Here you'll describe how you plan to engage with and recruit program participants from your target ETC priority communities. So we wanna understand not only who you're serving, but how you plan to reach them and let them know about this opportunity you're providing. Question five is cultural inclusivity. Oftentimes program participants from ETC priority communities come from different cultural backgrounds and experiences or levels of comfort in the outdoors and at the coast. How does the program include all participants and consider differences in cultural and social backgrounds, past experiences, knowledge, comfort levels, et cetera, when participating in program activities? Do your staff have lived experience or training to be culturally inclusive? Next slide, please. Question six is on ability inclusivity, and it asks applicants to describe how the program will serve people with physical, cognitive, or emotional disabilities. This is a question that we score, uh, whether or not you have indicated that your project specifically serves those communities. So we'd like you to answer this question still. Uh, make sure you put in an answer. Even if your program is not specifically serving people with physical, cognitive, or emotional disabilities, you should answer this question. The likelihood is that any community that you are serving is going to have participants that fit this bill. So we want to see um, you thinking about this for your program. Next slide, please. Question seven asks applicants to describe how your organization builds and fosters connections with the community served through partnerships and leadership roles for the community. For example, individuals from the communities being served by the project are involved in its management, development, or implementation. Next slide, please. And then question eight, here you'll describe the ways in which the program is designed to have long-term positive impacts on participants. This can include leadership development, multi-year programs, family involvement, peer-to-peer -peer mentorship, multi-touch experiences, et cetera. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Morgan to continue on. Awesome. Thank you, Erin. So we're now moving on to question nine, scope. Here you will articulate three main parts to your project scope, which is project management, project preparation, and project implementation. In the description column, you'll briefly describe each scope area and tasks and activities to, that relate. In the timeline column, you'll state the expected start and end dates of each project scope category in month and year format. And finally, in the milestone column, you'll list significant steps reached in relation to each project scope category. For instance, a sample milestone for project preparation can be a completed roster of project participants or the completion of instructor recruitment. Next slide, please. All right, here is an overview of the budget. As Irvin mentioned previously, our grants are reimbursement based, meaning you'll have to pay for any project related costs upfront and submit your invoice to us for grant disbursement. We do apply a 5% withholding to each disbursement and will release the withholding when the project is considered finished. We allow a percentage of grant funds to be dispersed upfront if that is necessary for your financial operations. If selected, you'll want to discuss this option with your project manager. For the budgets, applicants are allowed to budget up to 20% of their grant total towards indirect costs. And as you are completing your budget, please round up to the nearest $100. For more information on allowable costs, please refer to our Explore the Coast allowable cost document which can be found on our website and will be linked in the chat momentarily. Looks like it's there, thank you. All right, next slide. So we offer two submission formats for your budget tables. The first one is by task and the second is by cost category. We will go over both formats over the next two slides. Next slide, please. The first option is by task. This format reflects what we use for the project work program and invoicing once a grant is approved. This facilitates ease of invoicing for our team, 
and we strongly suggest that you use the three tasks we have defined, project management, project preparation, and project implementation. In the narrative portion, please break down the project implementation costs by labor, equipment, supplies, transportation, and other. We recognize that this may not be the way you usually create budgets, so we are offering a second way to budget for the application. Uh, you will, however, eventually have to use the task format and staff can offer technical assistance with this if your grant is approved. Next slide, please. The second option is by cost category. This format is more intuitive as you allocate costs by the type of expense, such as personnel, equipment, subcontractors, et cetera. In the narrative here, you'll estimate the percent of staff time spent on project management and preparation versus delivery of programs or implementation. Under implementation, please summarize your anticipated costs for equipment and supplies and the cost and role of subcontractors. Next slide, please. Questions 11 and 12 are other budget related questions. Question 11 asks if there are any costs for to participants in the program. Will the, program, will the grant enable the program to be free or subsidized? And if offering scholarships or subsidies, how will participants be selected? Question 12 asks what the total cost of the program is and if there are any other funders. As a side note, matching funds and in-kind donations are not required to receive funding, but we do like to see those if you have them. Next slide, please. And question 13 is a three-part question regarding your organization's capacity to implement the project. We ask when your organization was established, details about the organization's size and location. Uh, the question asks about staff expertise and experience in administrating grants of similar size and completing similar projects. And we also ask about the involvement of any project partners. You'll describe any pro project partner roles here. And this wraps up question 13 and now passing it back to Irvin. Next slide, please. Thanks, Morgan. Um, so now I'm going to go over the scoring criteria. The scoring criteria serves as a guidance on how projects will be evalu evaluated. So we recommend looking at the criteria to get an idea of what we're looking for and how each question is weighted and scored. Um, the scoring criteria can be found on our website in the application instructions, and um, we're also going to drop a link in the in the box right now. Next slide. Um, let's see. So technical assistance, office hours. Um, if you have any like more, um, as a resource applicant, uh, we're going to hold two Zoom sessions that we refer to as um, office hours to help with. Um, application assistance, budget questions, and project eligibility. Um, attendees can ask questions that will be answered in a group setting. If more, if time and availability allows, attendees can request to be moved to a breakout room for one-on-one -on -one questions. Um, the first of the two office hour is on January 11th, um, 2024, from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. And the second office hour is from is on January 25th, um, 2024, from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. So if you're interested in these office hours, um, registration is required to access the Zoom link. Um, and I think we just dropped two um, separate registration link for the respective office hours in the in the chat box. Next slide. The Explore the Coast email. Um, so to, to request any um, project consultation or if you have any questions, um, you can reach us through the Explore the Coast email. Um, note that application submissions must be made to um, grant at scc.ca.gov, which is different from the our contact email, which is export coast at scc.ca.gov. Um, when you do reach out to contact us, um, please include the export to coast region um, of your project in your request, and someone in the region will respond. Next slide. Okay, so that is. Um, 
our presentation. We can stay for a few minutes to go over any general questions or um, any like specific project questions um, can be sent to our email. So yeah, the floor is open to any, any general questions that anyone has. So we do have, we've ha had a few questions that have been answered in the Q&A box that people can review. We can go over them later too, but we have a question from Maya Rogers that I wanted to um, have Maya unmute and clarify. They asked, is self-report acceptable? Um, I think that this was referring to uh, reporting on their participation from different Explore the Coast priority communities for answering that question of the application. Maya, are you able to talk? Yes, I. that's exactly what it was. It was um, the slide that talked about um, us documenting where we got the information from. And a lot of times it's self-report and I'm wondering if that's acceptable. Yes, that should be acceptable. Um, we added that field because our advisory board, which um, after we and staff review the applications, a certain number go on to our Explore the Coast advisory board and they help us make the final decisions. They, they had wondered where that information was coming from. So we added a spot in the application for people to provide that. If you are doing your own internal tracking of where the ETC uh, priority communities are, that's totally fine. We just want to know that. Okay, good. Thank you. And we have a question from Ashley. If we are serving students from Title I schools from a community that is not labeled as an Explore the Coast priority community, does this still count towards the 70% requirement? So to clarify the it's a Title I school, that likely means that a number, that a percentage of those students are from an Explore the Coast priority community because I believe Title I refers to low income. That's one of our Explore the Coast priority communities. So that could count towards your 70% minimum. Does that clarify the question? Ashley, I'm gonna allow you to unmute if you want to clarify. Thank you, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so I was specifically asking um, about San Luis Obispo County because this is not a county that was listed that I saw, at least in the maps, as an EPC priority community. Um, but there is, I think, over 70% of our elementary schools in Slow County um, are Title I. So I just wanted to clarify if you know we're not a part of that ETC priority community, but there are a lot of students here who are considered underserved. Yeah, sorry, I can see where that's confusing. So we ask about two separate things. The first is the priority communities, which includes the, you know, the groups that are facing those kinds of systemic barriers. So things like, um, you know, veterans, um, low income, uh, people of color. And then there's also the location. And that's what that map was, because we try to uh, ensure that our programs are reaching a far spread of Californians. So we, that map refers to just where in California your participants are coming from. Gotcha. So even if, just to make sure that I understand, so even if our participants aren't coming from those one of those highlighted areas, but they're in a, a population that's considered underserved, that's still qualified in the 70%? Yes. And San Luis Obispo County should be in one of those regions. It's in our central coast region. Okay, I, I didn't see it on one of the maps, but maybe I, I missed it. Um, so I'll take a look again. Yeah, that should be that should be fine. So you would have in the top part 70% of, you know, for the priority communities, and then you would indicate that 100% are coming from the Central Coast region if all of your participants are from SLO. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Erin. And our next question is from Tracy. Is it preferred to offer a program to a smaller group of people with repeated visits or offer a program to a larger group of people for one time beach visit each? I can take that one too. So the question was kind of getting at the like quality over quantity. Um, we don't we really look at the participant experience. 
So if you're doing smaller trips that are more focused and, and multi-touch, that's not going to necessarily score any better or worse than a project where it's a big group of people going to the coast once. It just really depends on how you're um, working with those other questions, you know, how much you have the cultural sensitivity and inclusivity, um, the long-term positive benefits, all of that. So if you're delivering on all those other factors, that, that shouldn't play too much of a role. I don't know if anyone else wants to add in or I'll just add um, for that one factor of long-term positive impact, um, have, like having repeat visits, uh, we, we believe will create more of that long-term positive impact and uh, make people more likely to come back and visit on their own. So that is something that can strengthen your application, but there might be ways that in, in your one-time visits where you're incorporating that as well, which Erin was getting at. So. Um, I would encourage you to schedule a consultation with us to talk out the details of your program and you can get more specific guidance. Our next question is from Lee. I just want to clarify the eligibility for current grantees. Our current grant will be completed before March 1st, 2026, but we won't be able to start by the aim to start dates of late 2024 or early 2025. Are we still eligible to apply? Um, I might wanna see that question email just so I can look over more specifically, but from what I heard, you should still be eligible to apply, yeah. I, I agree, the answer is yes. <laughs> Um, the next question from an anonymous attendee, do potential partners of grantees need to demonstrate commitment like letters of support or could partners be firmed up later if the grant is awarded given the tight timeline? It's a good question. Um, I'm trying to think about our scoring. I think that if, if it's a potential partner, we would like to know that, and our advisory board would probably like to know that. So I would note that in the application, um, but I don't think we need to see support letters with the application. And yeah, I would say list it, go ahead and list it, and then just note that it's um, you know a potential partner and anyone else please free feel, to, feel free to add on. I was gonna add on that we um, ask for letters of support once we notify um, applicants that they've been um, selected for, for the funding. So you don't need the letters yet, but I totally agree with Erin that just showing that you have this potential partnership and um, that it would be solidified after um, the grant award. Thanks, Erin and Bryce. I'll also just add that if you do have partners that are already committed, it does strengthen your application, especially if you have track record working with the partner, though obviously for newer programs, that might not be possible, which makes sense too. Another question just came in from Danielle. If our program is funded through another entity, but we are applying for transportation for participants, what is the best way to make that clear in the grant application? And do you want to see all the details of the funded program in the application? Um, that's a great question. I can think of at least one grant that we have where it is paying our funds are paying just for the transportation. I would say in the project description, make it really clear what the conservancy funds are gonna be paying for. And then also we'd love to know what the program is overall. In the budget questions, I believe there's a place where, so for your table, you would indicate that, you know, if all of the funds are going to transportation, that would go into the project implementation 
task and then you would explain this is just conservancy funds will just pay for transportation that will make it really clear for all the reviewers and then there's also a place where you can show the other funding we do like to know about that um because that helps us know that even though we're just paying for transportation there's budget for the the overall program which may be a really wonderful program that we'd like to support thanks Erin. There's no other questions right now. Everybody, please feel free to add in more questions. Okay, here's another one from Cherry. Um, how do we document the at least 70% of participants served by the grant must be from ETC priority communities requirement? For context, this is the PTO from a Pacifica public school. Our project would be to expand parking and access so it would expand access to the coast but we don't have a concrete way of ensuring that 70% of participants are from ETC priority communities. Um, are we able to, I thought I saw Sheree raise her hand or their hand. Let me see if I unmute. Okay. Sherry, I think you should be able to unmute yourself now. For sense, did that question make sense? I mean, we're trying to figure out how coastal communities, hi Trish, uh, could kind of work with, you know, with this grant and whether this would be an, like a reasonable um, pathway to expand coastal access and kind of leverage some local buy-in on, in coastal communities that are actually quite, sometimes traditionally quite, um, you know, quite, uh, you know, a resistance to, you know, try to bridge that gap between areas which are really rich in these coastal resources, but sometimes short on revenue and short on local buy-in and creating and enhancing like local, like parking, um, where a school, uh, I'm from a PTO that has a school that's right on the other side of Highway 1. It's an ideal spot for people from underserved communities to go to Lindemar Beach, but there, you know, but we're trying to figure out how to bridge kind of, you know, all these really rich community resources with um, with people who deserve to and need access to the coast when we've already kind of overbuilt our communities and have a bunch of houses there. But there are still a number of public lands that are available. We just need to figure out some way to bridge it. So we were just wondering how you would document the 70% I mean, I think it would be a heavy lift for coastal communities to go out and look for ETC priority communities. But um, I wanted to see if there was any, like how, you know, I guess more mechanically for this general conversation, how we can, um, how how participants, you know, document that 70% as well. And then, you know, if, if we get a little bit further down, how we can kind of enhance these opportunities. Does that make sense? Yeah, so correct me if I'm misunderstanding your, your question, but it sounds like the funding that you're looking for is for facilities. But it would actually be to rent out the parking lot at the school, which is right now closed to anybody. You know, like if you're driving from Baby Hunters Point 20, you know, 20 minutes away, you cannot park in Pacifica. You know, it's really difficult to park in Pacifica, right? But the school actually has a policy of charging for parking on weekends, you know, and then we would use this money to help fund the school district, right, but also, you know, open up parking. Um, I think I'm getting a little bit too specific, and this might be an office hour question, which is why I was trying to make it a general question about 70% of participants. <laughs> Yeah, so I would say I think uh, if you could email Explore the Coast to ask for a consultation, because when I hear that project description, I'm not I'm not sure it's 100 percent a fit with this grant program, um, which is more about, you know, bringing people to the coast. Um, it's possible I'm wrong about that, but I think it's enough in the weeds that a more dedicated conversation might help. Generally, we're not, you know, we don't pay for facilities or improvement of facilities through this grant program or, or um you know, in improving facilities or our access points. Um, so I think we need a more dedicated conversation to figure out if that project is a fit for Explore the Coast or some of our other more general conservancy grant programs. Awesome, thanks so much. Thank you. 
we have any other questions in the audience? I see Sarah in the chat asked, could the applicant organization host two or three different experiences for two to three different orgs? Or is it better to partner with a single organization? How about we have Sarah unmute to say a little more? I think it's a gray area for sure. <laughs> Yeah, no, we've, um, we do have a facility on the coast and um, we're popular during this time and we've been asked by two or three different organizations if they could come to use our facilities as part of this. And I'm just wondering if it's, um, if we could, if we could use completely different organizations that aren't related to each other, but, and who want a different experience, but all under the roof of a single grant through that we would be the administrators for. Would the funding be paying for that facility to then be free for the participants when they come to stay? Yes. I think um, that's fine. And you could explain that that's what the grant funding would go towards and then put your project partners, you could list the people who have approached you about using that space. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to also weigh in on that question, but that's my gut sense just hearing the question. And the third, the second follow up to that would be um, if one or two are identified, but one remains unidentified, is that possible because we don't know we have a number of partners, but we might not have it solidified about which specific partner would come. We'd have all the other data on. Yeah, so you could say, you know, well, first you're gonna you're gonna want to know even if it's estimating that what the priority communities are. So if you know the organizations, what kinds of uh, participants are being served in the specifics, you could use that, and then say we are also gonna open it up to these kinds of organizations. You know, just making clear that it's an opportunity to bring people out to the coast and subsidize their um, their costs for staying there. Um, Shalini, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree. And Sarah, I'd really encourage you to schedule a consultation with us. This is kind of like a uniquely structured program, like different than a lot of our other applicants who would be like the organization that's um, coming to visit. You So um, I think this could be a great project, but it would be good to talk it through with us and get um, a little more specific. Thanks. I already have signed up. So okay, also great. It's, um, I, I think the issue for small organizations is administration of reimbursement grants. So that's something that we could do for them. So I think that's where our strength lies. Thank you. That's awesome. Uh, we have a question from Ashley. Is there a recommended amount of funding to request for an organization that has not applied to this grant before, but has received funding for other grants from the Coastal Commission? I think they probably mean Coastal Conservancy or maybe the Coastal Commission, they also have grants. <laughs> um, I, I feel like that's for the amount you need up to $100,000. Um, I don't think that's something we specifically look, specifically look at, like, oh, if you're a new organization, you should not be asking for a certain amount of money. So I would say ask for the amount that you need and then make the argument in the budget section for what that money is going to go towards why you need that amount. And when discussing your applicant capacity, um, just make sure to uh, like list your experience with administering similar grants. Um, I'd say that's like what we look at more than the specific amount. Any more questions?
Laura asks, remind me if this is a one-year grant or multi-year. So uh, the amount of funding that you request, it's a little bit up to you if you want that to be for one year of programming or multiple. We do, we are looking for projects that are completed by December, 2027. So that's the, the kind of upward limit on the, on the time frame. Thanks, Erin. Any more questions? We still have about 12 minutes, so we'll hang on here and wait for questions. Is it okay if I unmute and ask another one out loud, Shalon? Please. Okay, I just wanted to clarify with the partnerships. Um, I think I heard it correctly, but again, just kind of wanted to make sure um, if there are potential partnerships that we're hoping to establish um, with an organization like a kayaking company or a whale watching company, um, but those haven't been fully uh, secured yet, would we just indicate that we're working on, or you know, in our timeline, working on establishing those partnerships? Um, and then for any partnerships that we might already have, providing um, verification that those partnerships are already, already there. Yeah, that sounds right to me. Okay, thanks. I think especially like with um, outfitters or vendors, um, those don't have to be clearly decided yet. Like a lot of times um, grantees might pick one and then change it just because of little logistical things. So it's okay if the vendors aren't as outlined, but um, in terms of like people partnerships and the groups that will be serving your participants directly and like recruiting them, I think those partnerships we, we want to hear more about. I see some people are dropping off. So just we'll just insert a thank you for coming and being interested in our grant program. Um, you're all doing amazing things on the coast and we're excited that you're coming to us to fund it. <laughs> Good luck with your applications. Reach out to us with questions. But we'll still stay here until the time's up. 